Welcome back, everybody, to uh, another episode of Energy Bites. John Calfan here with uh, my wonderful co-host, Bobby Nealon. How's, up? How's it going, Bobby? Great. Going great. We've got our guest today, Andrew Munoz, CTO at Forecast now. Mm-hmm. Is that yep. correct? Cool. Swiss army knife of oil and gas. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you I'm, for bringing that up. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm jealous you stole that uh, that tagline because that's I feel like I'm similar in a lot of senses. The I looked at a lot of profiles. None, right? Yeah, because I was trying to figure out like, okay, I don't want to do something stupid like polymath or some dumb yeah. like that. But I'm like, I'm doing <laughs> geophysics and engineering and I've like picked up a lot of skills, yeah. data science. But I wanted to have something that was sort of tasteful that was yeah. a good tagline kind of coming out of being an op- being a geophysicist and an operator. Yeah. So yeah. no, it's it's good. I yeah. like it. Thanks. <laughs> uh before we get into it, if you're liking the podcast, please go give us a review. If you're listening, if you're watching, please lo- hit the like button, try and subscribe. Um we're getting really good responses and feedback. We really appreciate uh you guys listening in. So with that, get that out of the way. Let's jump into it. Tell us a little about yourself. So Yeah. So I, I've spent um, over a decade working for for operators. Um, first at, at Newfield, I was a geophysicist, and uh, you know had a lot of great experiences, great mentors there. Um, and uh, and then I hopped over to private equity uh, uh, operator, Ensign Natural Resources. We bought Pioneer's position in Eagleford, and um, got to be the geophysicist for that that company, and and build a lot of my own tools and. Um, build a lot of the workflows doing things the way that, you know, I wanted to do it on the geophysics side and met a lot of great people. And, uh, and now I, um, sort of jumped into the, the sharky waters of entrepreneurship and <laughs> joined, uh, uh, you know, forecast and, uh, I'm the developer for the software now and have kind of rewritten it in the way that, that I felt is a really optimal way of doing it. And it's, it's been a great ride so far. And I've, got a lot of a lot of history we can dive into what you know why i've done certain things sure. and where i've acquired certain skills um so whatever you guys want to talk about i'm open to cool yeah um no i mean with? i guess just as far as you know i guess maybe coming but when is the first time you touched you know coding or tech or when did you really get that bug yeah yeah can, then, can you to that point preface that with just give the non uh oil and gas folks just a, a brief understanding of what geophysics is and, and what, what, what it is but what they you know, like what you guys do yeah absolutely well first i'll uh go ahead and plug uh the energy 101 podcast uh, you can hop on that and get a really uh, high level overview of uh, geophysics and geology and how we're important in the industry but basically geophysicists are responsible for interpreting um this data that creates an image of the subsurface creates an image of where rocks are deep down and it's called seismic data and we use sound waves to build those images and we interpret them and then use them to plan and develop oil and gas wells. And so you can't see thousands of feet into the ground. So this is a way of, of remotely doing that. And that's the primary skill that geophysicists uh, bring to uh, oil and gas operators. And we're needed to de-risk wells, to plan them, to... Um, figure out where oil and gas is say. in some cases. So for conventional, um, for conventional wells, we really are identifying where it exists. Yeah. You're so. kind of the, uh, explorers, so to speak of the, the sub. That's why right? I loved it because it's like, when I first saw it, it's like, Oh, you're like building a treasure map. You know, so yeah. you're the, you're the treasure find, you're the explorer, right? Yeah. This is uncharted territory. And so what you're seeing is things that humans have never laid eyes on eyes on, yeah. but you're, you're seeing it remotely and you're like, all right, let's go, let's go find this yeah. let's go explore and it happened Sweet. over millions of years it happened over millions of all years. kinds of crazy features to it and all that fun stuff it's incredible what the earth can do over millions of years with yeah. burying sediment and eroding sediment and and all shifting that. it and, yeah. yeah and causing <laughs> causing breaks and faults in the ground and it's it's a pretty neat world and not only the time scales but the the uh size of yeah. these yeah. basins is hundreds of miles i mean these basins are huge and the size of these geologic features are, are yeah. huge um, so we work in very different scales than what n- most people live in. Yeah. But even with that, it's, I mean, it's not all, you know, homogenous either. Right. I mean, it's like yeah, for one, you know, within, a, yeah. within a few miles and you, I know I spent some time working the Eagle for too. It's like, yeah, you can go a couple miles up, down, dip, whatever. And things are totally different. Like, very different. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, you could put wells in, in, in a lot of the, a lot of this area and unconventionals, but it's not always economic. And yeah. It's not always the product that you want, you know, that's, uh, definitely times for oil and gas and and so knowing where you are and understanding how to economically extract 
uh, these minerals is, yeah. is really important. So how did you get get into kind of coding and, and the tech side of things? Yeah, so that is an interesting story. I, I never was a software engineer like that. I don't have that formal background. Yeah. I started early in my undergraduate, some undergraduate research projects uh, in Fortran, Fortran 77 specifically. Wow. And I was doing some uh, reduction to the pole magnetic filters. So like a magnetic space geophysics. And just really simple projects like doing 2D Fourier transforms and kind of programming them and doing some neat uh, some neat research projects. And then I got a little more advanced. I started working with a professor in my undergraduate um, where Robert Weiss, where we were doing uh, tsunami modeling. So we're doing three-dimensional uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics and we were doing C++, uh, using C++ to, to build these um, three-dimensional tsunami models. And it's really cool and measuring inundation lengths and um, I learned a lot about GPUs in that time because okay. SPH uses uh, GPUs to do the computations. So I, I got a really early introduction to yeah, NVIDIA. That's kind of ahead of its time. Tesla's, like, you know, yeah, really, really early. This is like 2008, I guess, 2009. Yeah. So pretty be before NVIDIA kind of blew up in the AI tech space um, and before you know people really had a lot of GPU programming, we were programming in CUDA. And CUDA is right. like a very low level language compared mm -hmm. to you know what exists now for GPU programming. And it was a great introduction to to that world and to the hardware and the software world. And then I went and visited um, Colorado School of Mines for graduate school. And I, I this is a very um, something I can highly recommend if you're under, undergraduate and you really wanted to get into a certain graduate program, buy a, call them and, and schedule a time, buy a ticket, buy a plane ticket, go there, tour the campus, meet the advisor, and spend time learning about them and and seeing why you might be interested in working yeah. with them because. God, that was such a good, such a great way to not only get into a competitive program, but to just get to know it and yeah. to understand it. So Dave Hale was my advisor there. Just absolutely brilliant guy, right? I mean, just just a workhorse and knows so much. Um, you know, he's instrumental in building landmarks um, uh, software systems for okay. geophysics. And just like, I think he, I think he actually, I, I don't know if this is, how true this is i think he took the original like c code and 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 turned it all into c plus plus like turn all into object oh, wow. oriented code for the whole decision place God. platform um what it exists today so don't you know landmark folks don't don't come after me but i'm pretty sure he was very instrumental in that and just a super sharp guy so pretty from, good person to be uh learning from yeah he's a great gate, person right? to learn from <laughs> yeah. and he's he's very involved in what you're doing so yeah. he's like really in it every day with you and he's trying to do things himself like he's very he's a very prolific researcher he retired not not long after i left but um he's a very prolific researcher and a really sharp guy so what was cool about him was his involvement in teaching you and and having you kind of throwing you in the deep end learning yeah um and from him i learned um python and java so he was a okay. big Jython guy. I don't know if people know what Jython is, but I mean, dive into it. That's what we yeah, yeah, that's what we're here for. Prior to Python three version three point which is what most people use nowadays, Python two point seven um, could integrate with Java using these Jython libraries. And so you can basically take a statically typed language that compiles like Java, which is really fast. I mean, when you're working with big data sets, right. seismic, yeah. you need something like that. I mean, you need something that can run really quickly. And this is before Python really had a lot of the yeah. vectorized optimizations that it has today. Um, so in J Jython, you have all these compiled Java classes that you can you know, work on and create. And, and, and so he had this great library called the Minds GTK, which I think some are still maintained by some ex students today yeah. um, that has all these fantastic Java classes <laughs> for working with seismic data and, and, and log data. And so I, I did some research based on that and I started a master's degree and I decided to flip it and do a PhD. And then it just, you know, it wasn't really for me, I think. And I, I was happy to hop out of that and go work at Newfield in Denver. And, and fortunately I timed it in 2014 to where I was getting right in the crash. So <laughs> yeah, that's, got, that's got the when, job that's when I got into and, the uh, yeah. industry as well as yeah. July, 2014. Exactly. <laughs> got out, got, got, got my full-time job secured, um, and sort of rode that wave. Um, but I learned so much there and that's where I got the base for my, my Python, uh, programming skills that I use mostly today. And, I still do a little bit of um, Java if I ever have to do any type of work with Seismic and, and Jython specifically. Still have some builds that, yeah. that let me use some of that code. But um, 
but I, throughout my career at Newfield, I did a lot of geophysical work using mm -hmm. some, some of those mines, GTK libraries and code <laughs> using Python. And I got more and more proficient in Python as it went along too. And I think the real breaking point was I was making all kinds of little libraries for doing log analysis, rock physics, um, you know, programming things that, that you just didn't see in these mainstream geoscience packages, yeah. you know, looking at log data and doing petrophysical analysis. And I was getting more and more proficient. And then the break point was when I, I moved down to Houston and I was on the exploration team and I was sort of helping the assets at the time optimize their developments. And, and I was doing some work with geophysics, a little bit of work in data science myself. And then this, they hired this guy, Mac Burton, who was a uh, reservoir engineer coming from Anadarko and he was on their data analytics team and they're sort of like known around the yeah, industry Anadarko like had a really good program really good data analytics team and, yeah. and data analytics team and they had they used agile uh, yep. methods for development and um, and he he came in and create started this group with Sebastian Martrin she's who's, who's at Hess now he they they had this this group they formed this group where they were trying to do data science and analytics you know inside inside Newfield and um, use this agile, you know, methodology for development. And so I didn't actually like join the team, but I was the geoscience member of that team. So I, you know, started kind of early on with them bringing in geoscience data and, and my boss was really happy to see that, you know, he wanted us involved in that. Um, what, a, what another novel idea. You know, yeah. Right, bringing right, in right. the SMEs to exactly. the, to the data science groups yeah. instead of just passing and, it off to them. And that was me. Like I was more focused on like, okay, I knew a lot about exploration. I knew a lot about the data because I was trying to do things with the data. Yeah. And so at that point, I didn't have any SQL experience. I didn't really know. A I knew a little bit about databases, but um, I was sort of involved in some of the data science projects because I was helping bring the geoscience data into them. Sure. So when we were using external uh, vendors and things like that. So we get this group started and Matt brings all these great ideas around, um, you know, linear predictions and multivariate linear models yeah. and statistics and, you know, like really basic stuff. You got to get people over sure. in order for them to, to do, to the understand and accept data scale, science, right? right? And so um, we spent a lot of time educating and creating really simple ideas. And that's where I really started to expand my Spotfire skills. I'd been using Spotfire for a lot of other things. Sure. Um, but on, from the data science perspective, I really started expanding my Spotfire skills, programming in R, programming in Python in Spotfire before like it was... Um, before or, it was really easy to do. Yeah, you know, the Python data functions. <laughs> like right now when, are way easier. Yeah, right when Spotfire X came out, uh, Spotfire uh, and they skip from was, seven to ten. Like, yeah, exactly. Like skip iPhone. from seven to ten. Um, and they were like, it's X. Yeah. And so right when that came out, then you can use Python data functions with a lot of headache uh, to to get it working. And so I started using that a little bit more, but we were more R focused at the time. And so um, did a lot of great stuff with them, and I I started learning a little bit of SQL, a little bit of database, and and I just learned the workflow of how to do you know, production prediction and how to integrate all this data. Right. And then when um Encana announced the acquisition of Newfield, I was like, oh, this is this is fun. So I had I had gone out and I'd looked for um I had gotten a job with um Insign. And so they were in the middle of closing this deal with Pioneer buying the Eagleford asset and they wanted me to be the geophysicist for that. And I'm like, all right, we want you to come in and stand up the geophysics program. And yeah. we we had to buy a lot of seismic. We needed to buy like a thousand squares of seismic which is a pretty big area. I mean, it's across a few hundred miles. Yeah. And um, we needed to buy a lot of seismic and um, understand this very structurally complex part of the Eagleford. And so I was like, all right, well, I would also like to do all this really cool data science stuff. I've been working on this for years. You know, I've got this programming skills. Like, yeah, yeah, that's great. Let's uh, <laughs> hold your horses. My boss was like, just make sure you get the geophysics done and then we'll talk about that. I was like, all right. So I get, so I start the job in like May of 2017. And I, um, or was it 2017? Yeah, it was 2017. Um, I, uh, immediately start, um, man, no, it was it 2019? Shoot, I don't remember. Sorry, guys. Whenever I started <laughs> Insign, whatever year it was. It's just pre-COVID pre and yeah. post-COVID yeah, pre is really what, what. I can't remember if, uh, I think my, yeah, my first child was already born. So it was definitely after 2017. Um, so I guess it was 2019. So 2019, I start. And we, um, and I was so excited to get through all the geophysics part. Not, I mean, we needed to have it done. Like it was yeah. really important. Like it was very integral to our, to our success in operating. Um, I spent a week over that thousand squares just interpreting all the data. Like I finished it. Like I picked like 700 faults. I picked four different horizons, like picked the Buda, the Eagleford, the Anacacho, the Austin Chalk. And I was done within like a week. And I spent yeah. like 14 hours a day doing this because I wanted to get it done. 
And they're like, you didn't have to do it that fast. (laughs) Like, Like, no, I've got motivation. Yeah, Yeah. no, I want to do this. And so, and then we went through a couple of things like, okay, I went, I conditioned the data, did some gather work and things like that. And then I, you know, adjusted it, but I was done really early. So by the fall, I was, and we were starting to operate our first rig. By the fall, I was ready to start doing my data science. I was like, all right. So I started from the ground up and I built everything kind of in Spotfire with Python and R scripts and started building all these dashboards. And the cool thing about InSign was we had all these fantastic uh, techs and uh, people who knew programming and um, who were just instrumental in creating these amazing backend that, you know, we could yeah. plug into and it allowed us to do, you know, these really cool analytics projects. And so I got to work with these guys and I got really proficient at SQL, you know, learning it from them and just practicing it. And then I was able to start building my own, um, you know, tables and databases. And I started just, I created this whole, you know, data science, uh, these all these data science products that we're then using to help inform some of our decision making. Yeah, and I was integrating the geophysics data, the attribute data, um, geologic data, and so I just got a really strong, you know, background in doing that and building yeah. it from the ground up, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so from that, I, I we you know decided to sell the company and uh, put it put it up to market, and it had a you know great successful exit to, to Marathon. And then once uh, our TSA was up with that in March, I uh, I had I had already been advising Zach Copeland on on uh, on forecast, and I was like he was like all right well let's let's do this you know you want to be the developer yeah. of this and I was like sure sounds fun <laughs> you know it's <laughs> entrepreneurial I've always wanted to do that yeah um and get a taste for that and so from the beginning I just just help sort of reboot you know he had a great minimum viable product he had a lot of uh, great customers that were using it. And I was like, all right, let's start. I'm going to build this how I, the same vision, right? Yeah. How I want to do this. And so I built the whole back end, and then we went through and, um, you know, rewrote all the code yeah. for, um, for the software. So, and then released it and have been, been selling it since. So it's, it's pretty fun. I honestly um, think that's probably one big reason for you success. So, uh, quickly is just, you know, having a, having the subject matter expert or the user help mm-hmm. write the software that they <laughs> are using exactly is a very critical uh, component of software development and i think that's where a lot of people stumble right is you go hire a dev shop or you got this big dev team mm-hmm. yeah. and then none of them have any or they have very minimal understanding of what the actual workflows are what the realistic you know whether it's the databases or the security or the permissions mm-hmm. or where the, the structure of the day all of those things they don't necessarily, you know, they think of things in a per like in physics, right? It's in a yeah. vacuum, right? And so everything happens perfectly in this yeah. vacuum. But in the real world, that's not how it actually happens, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. That's 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 really cool. How did uh so your like programming journey, so to speak, was that pretty much all self taught? Did you get any kind of formalized training in that? Yeah. Kind of sense or I didn't you know, I had I had a few mentors, you know, I had a few people that I could kind of tap into. Yeah. But to be honest, in the oil and gas industry, there's not that many. Yeah. Um, you know, I had I had spent some early time um looking at a lot of stuff that like Matt Hall was doing when he had agile geosciences. He was always producing some great content and it gave me a lot of, you know, good ideas of how to leverage Python and my mm-hmm. own workflows. Um, but yeah, it was honestly a lot of it is going out and finding a problem and yeah. then just figuring out a way to solve it. Right. Yep. It's like, well, I've got this toolbox, I've got this giant toolbox of 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 Python. And at <laughs> the time I was using a lot of Python too, but really started moving more towards, you know, later stage Python. And I was like, I can do a lot with this. So I started finding all these problems and yeah. trying to see if I could solve them using programming. And uh, I just had to learn how to do it. You yeah. know, over time I got more proficient and found more advanced tools that would help me along the way. And that's how I ended up, you know, where I am is just trying to solve every problem I found. Yeah, yeah, I can't agree more. I mean, yeah, you can do whatever formalized training you want, but it's never, never going to be tailored to what you're trying to do. And like, you just have to, I tell people yeah. all the time, you have to find a problem and try to solve it. And it may take you longer than it would take you to do in Excel, mm-hmm. but like, I promise you it's worth it if, yeah. if you like figure out how to do it. In and the- I like reading, like I like editing and reading technical papers. I do it, you know, a lot for SCG and things like that. But when it comes to reading about programming, it's so boring. It's, no, it's, it's so, so bad. It's just terrible. Or, I just <clears throat> so much rather do it and keep failing yeah, until I figure it yeah. out. And, and then I go research it, and then I go read about yeah, it. But yeah. like, it's got to be practical for me. Yeah, and I think like to your point, though, too, having good mentors helps mm-hmm. you. Like, someone that can unlock it. I mean, I, I'd say I had a couple at Conoco even where like, you know, I'm starting to learn R. And I'm like, 
I know how I would do this in Spotfire. How can yeah. I do it here? And then like someone unlocks something for you and then it's like, boom, yeah. you're off the races. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know. and, and those things exist, but there's also a really important component that a lot of people miss is like, there's so many ways to learn about how to do something or how to understand a package, you know, in our, yeah. in our Python. But the really challenging thing is how do you understand how a process works from its fundamentals? And yeah, that's yeah. where the mentors come in a lot is like, they might not know programming language. They, they might be new to them. You know, they're really experienced. They've used software, but they know how that software works. And right, so yeah. they're the ones you can go to, to understand the fundamentals and how to actually build something from the beginning. And so that's what I can say my, my mentors did the most is like helping me understand how this is working. And so then I can like, okay, now that I understand this, right. I can apply these tools and figure yeah. out how to make it work the same yeah. way. It's, I mean, it's, especially important when you're making that jump from like you know i'm just messing around with my you know uh fantasy football data yeah. dashboard that i'm building internally versus <laughs> spinning up a commercial we can talk about that too if you want that problems but, and yeah, yeah I love but even that. that but even just like i mean writing scripts and stuff that people are gonna end up making million dollar decisions right. on like, yeah. like like the, the stakes are so much higher much yeah. higher security there's so much more that goes into it right like to your point understanding how it actually works at the mm -hmm. core because then you start getting it especially with the type of the amount of data that you guys are talking about you have to optimize so it's like okay it works but now it takes you know it takes 30 seconds to load the page right now we got to mm -hmm. figure out that problem right, right? well like, when you have customers it's even like oh my gosh right like, <laughs> the every little thing is fast yeah. is mm -hmm. yeah is really important and and if you if you present a fast product you can never slow it down it's gotta no, go yeah. only it's <laughs> only gotta go faster <laughs> yeah. so that gets even more challenging one in you know three to five seconds staring at a website is mm -hmm. so much longer yeah. than you really think no, yeah. it is yeah. if you're a user and it just that's how long it takes to load pages yeah. but, it, it's, but to that end you have to have that step in between to make it work well before right. you work fast because <laughs> yeah, like right. a lamborghini with bad brakes is mm -hmm. you know really dangerous too you know, like, yeah. yeah that's why we were talking about like is is there a point where we get off like right now you know our front end is built off Spotfire, and we can do a lot with that i mean it's very powerful and we can make modifications really quickly and yeah. do a lot with it um and we're so customized with it that it's almost like having you know it's almost like having custom software so i think the thing that the only way to get faster is to you know write your own react frameworks right like you yeah. have to have your own framework and be able to control how things are cached in order to make it really fast and mm -hmm. really interactive for the users and that's kind of our next steps like well that's really the only way we can go yeah make it quicker yeah yeah a buddy, buddy of mine and i want to get him on here eventually he keeps putting it off but like uh he wrote a production optimization software or he, um but he was probably started out with a lot of spot fire he's really yeah. good with it but he had worked with his ukrainian developer and like they wrote their own visualization library in react yeah like not even using like you know plotly or say, any yeah. of these other things like yeah. they built their own to do because they knew what they had to do and it had to be fast. That's like, how I would do it. And I mean, and that's how we're going to do it. And that's, you know, you've got the perfect wireframe with Spotfire. Right. Because it's yeah, got right. like, all these Yeah, great it's an interactive wireframe. I think I was telling Zach yeah. that before. I was like, dude, you've got what you need. Like you hand it to the right developer and yeah. they can run yeah. with it. Like that, that's the it's easy one of the part, hardest you know. parts is, is if you don't have something explaining yeah, it's, it's how an interactive exactly, wireframe it, yeah. this is a functional thing like, yeah. just rebuild this better you know like how do you like yeah you have to explain to react developer how do i lay out all these states mm -hmm. and how do i make these thing these plots interact and how do i make these you know different different hooks and like you have to you have to know they can look at the tool itself and reverse engineer it essentially so it's like if, with a good a good developer like that yeah. so yeah exactly like this is the perfect way to start out yeah no that's i mean that's a direct camera uh <laughs> moment but that it's a really is just like a pro tip for anybody in that very early stage mvp software development mm -hmm. stuff is like if you have you know a free or white label type solution that you can uh leverage out of the gate it helps so much down the line because it yeah. one it gets you started and moving which is the hardest part of any business is yeah. doing it and you can make money on this product right. as you it can stands. Yeah. Like, you can start bringing revenue in and probably if your software it's arr which is a nice fat multiple on top yeah. of that but then it's also very easy to just say here mr developer yeah. make yeah. this yeah <laughs> right like you don't have to go and wireframe every single step yourself from scratch like yeah. even me like do doing some like bi development stuff like if someone can give me an excel sheet that's functioning like this is the logic yeah. that i yeah. want to build or, or even just can draw it on the board mm -hmm. like but have to yeah. have time people come like Hey, I want you to build me this. I'm like, okay, what show does that me. mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, like, I'm a visual. Like, show me, and mm -hmm. I, I can make anything happen. But like, exactly. Yeah. Or I mean, you also. Like, this happens all the time, still, uh, <laughs> in my experience. But it's like, hey, I want a button that does. You know, you put your your uh, 
requests in with features mm-hmm. and you put as much detail into it as possible the dev the developer goes and they you know they check it off their list but then you go and you actually use it and you're like this isn't what i want yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. yes there is this feature but it's unintuitive it's not where it needs yeah. to be whatever it may be and so just having something simple like that where it's like hey look this is exactly how i want it to work yep streamlines everything and you need to focus on what you're good at which is usually exactly. what you're selling the product to, to do yeah. right so it's like okay you know i know oil and gas and and how i want you know these tools to work so that's what i want to focus on right yeah. i'm not a yeah. front-end developer you know that's For that's sure. something i'm having to learn i was really wasn't even a back-end developer like i had a lot of <laughs> linux experience and that was again another thing that i learned early on was like okay when you're in ac- academia you have to learn how to build your own you know mm-hmm. back end and your own environment and um and so fortunately i had that and so when i had to stand up my own server i was like oh this is this is complicated like yeah. i thought i could do it really easily um and you know i can navigate linux really well but man there's so many things to consider and there's so much security implications mm-hmm. and, so and administrative things that you have to do and that takes a lot of time uh yeah but you know it's fun learning new things so yeah i, I enjoy it and when it's a motivated even a you're motivated yeah. because it's a business that you're part of and that you have obviously the equity in it but it just you know when you're motivated motivated by those problems yeah. like yeah i was talking to um sean if for those of you who don't know one of uh andrew's former colleagues is now my colleague yeah um, <laughs> <Sean Haslam. laughs> so yeah we're uh we were talking shop but he's like i i can do a little bit of networking but i hate it you know like yeah. I, I can never like that can never be my job yeah. like you know like but there's certain things that are motivating to you and then we can lean into those and it's fun. I hate to bring this up on the podcast. I hope you don't get mad, Sean. Have you seen his YouTube shorts and YouTube channel? I looked at a couple, but okay. I mean, yeah. He's got some funny ones. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was cool. I was like, Oh, this is awesome. Like yeah. he's got some really, really funny content on here. And it's yeah. like sort of making fun of, you know, junior versus senior software developers <laughs> and things like that. But yeah, that's an example of a really sharp guy who helped me along and helped our journey along and ensign, you know, who's just instrumental in creating these tools and yeah. the back end. So with that, I mean, Say what you're using now, say at, mm-hmm. at Forecast, where, like, what are some things that you can point to like, oh, that was an Ensign thing that I brought with me or that was a, something I learned at Newfield or different stops along the way and like how's that kind of culminated in what yeah, you're doing now? Yeah, it all is. I mean, especially in the production kind of data space. Right? Yeah. Because like, every, every oil and gas company listening to this has production data, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, most of it is just like the the knowledge of how to deal with reservoir data, reservoir engineering data, like production data. Yeah. Um, what is important when you're looking at analytics, uh, when you're looking at wellheader data, so you're looking at job size and spacing and how do you classify things and what importance do you put on that when you put it in your front end? Yeah. Like how do you how do you emphasize certain things? What type of plots are important? Do you want to cum plots? Do you want rate plots? Like having all that knowledge is super important for deciding what's what's important to show people. Yeah. Um, because if it's not important, they don't want to see it. They don't want a million options, a million buttons. We try to keep it as simple as we can because it's like, well, we just want to show you what's important, what you really need to do to get a value on this deal or a value on your wells or yeah. what you need to do to do a type curve, right? I just want simple things, simple intuitive things. Yeah. If I can have a land, I mean, this is this is what's amazing about the way that we we built forecasts. We have landmen picking up the software who don't have are very smart, but they don't have technical backgrounds. Right. Yeah. And they can go and run a deal. You know, they can do for they can do forecasts and they can even adjust them and, and kind of make things fit better. And they can put on all the parameters and, and all the inputs that they need and they can run a deal in, in no time. Yeah. And uh that's the type of, you know, software that I like to build, stuff that anybody can use. Sure. It's typically the best software. It's the best software. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you can teach a non technical person. You don't even have to teach them, right? Yeah, you don't have to teach them. I mean, <laughs> there was there was a one of our clients who's incredible. He's he's just super sharp. He's a he's a kind of a land finance guy. We we gave him a license at the beginning of Urtec this year, and like it was like a, a Monday or something. Just send him a send him a login. He was going to be web player, so it was really yeah. easy. We just send him a, send him a login and, and send him a link. And by the end of the week, I mean he was like a power user. I mean he was asking me questions on like the third day of Urtec. I was like, how? Wait, you've only been using the software for like two days, and we've been at a conference here in Denver. And right. Like yeah. you're, you're still <laughs> using it and like really good with it, really proficient with it. And so it was, it's amazing how fast you know some people can pick it up and, awesome. and run with it. That's a testament to to y'all, not necessarily. I mean, obviously, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, that's no. I mean, that's that's to, in my opinion, UI UX is one of the most challenging things, specifically in our industry, because yeah. we have gotten so used to the like old school. Hey, it's not broken. Don't we're not mm-hmm. going to fix it. We'll add new things to it, but we're still going to run on this old, you know, uh, antiquated on, system, right? On a yeah. virtual machine that's run on Windows ninety five. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like very archaic type stuff. I think, but, but also to your point though, too, is like knowing what's important because yes. you know 
you can fall into a trap of, and I think some companies chases of the customer's always right. Oh yeah, we'll add that feature. And then you just, yeah. it's just bloated with buttons and pages and stuff. And no one knows what the hell to do. Yeah. You know, where it's like, no, we know what 80% of our people want to do with this. We're going to focus on that core functionality. Yeah. yeah. I have a rule and I tell clients this too. I'm like, if I have two clients to like two paying clients, ask <laughs> me for a feature, I'll usually have the next day. Like I'll, yeah. I'll just throw it in and throw it, throw it out to them. Like, cause that's like, if it's that important that two independent people who don't know each other are asking me about it, right. then sure. it's important enough to put in the software. And then if there's like, at least I, it's kind of rough, but if there's five people who ask me for a specific feature or not clients, that's usually when I'll also do it Gotcha. and just throw it in the software. You know, if I have to, you know, run it overnight, I will yeah. for something simple, right? Like a button or like a, sure. you'd be surprised what's simple. Some things are simple. Some things, are <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, yeah. Some things that sound simple are really complicated. Uh -huh. Yeah. Simple, um, but not easy. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm working right now on this way to normalize all the formations uh, okay. automatically because people take that for granted when you have really cleaned up data sets from, from, from IHS or from in Paris, they do a really good job of going through and, and picking out these formations and cleaning them up and looking at target zones and all that. And so our, our intern Teague and I threw this problem at him. I was like, all right, good luck, buddy. Like he has no oil and gas experience. He's a financial, like financial economics, but he has programming, programming Python experience and he tackled it great. And I mean, we showed that at energy tech night, uh, how we had kind of cleaned up you know, right. the Anadarko basin and it's all automatic. It's all fuzzy logic. And you just sort of trust that the operators got, you know, some exposure to sure. what it is. And there's, there's rules around it. And I'm applying like some geologic things like, okay, the Merrimack doesn't go beyond this area. This is all Mississippi line simple things like that um, to to it. And then that pushes us into our spacing calculator. So now we're going to roll out this you know massive tool that does really accurate spacing calculations and incorporates parent child and code development and threaded wells and like all these classifications that let you filter them down really fast. And that's integral for doing fast type curves because yeah. you want to pick out similar wells to the type of development that you're going to do. So I'm not going to pass this opportunity up to promote the hashtag Hamadarko. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a funny <laughs> evolution. So we were Zach loves like Oklahoma, right? Like yeah. he's he's in Oklahoma. He's 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 Oklahoma born and bred. So he's very like, you know, yeah. involved. I think you find that pretty often. I mean, like, they may be more proud than Texans. It's pretty it's pretty <laughs> accurate. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> But it's great. And we yeah. get a lot of great, you know, local uh, content and ideas from that. And he's he's like very pro this idea that Harold Hamm just wants to acquire everybody in the Anadarko Basin. And so we're like, yeah, that's that's awesome. He's And so we were talking about ideas for Energy Tech Night and how we could do a demo. And I mean, the software is, is I mean, it's super fast. Like we can literally do yeah. an evaluation and come up with a number of what the PDP value is of the entire Anadarko Basin in a few minutes. Like it's it's that fast. And we did it so fast, we put it in a video for yeah. Energy Tech Night for the for the demo. And so the idea around that's like, well, what if we just consolidated the major players in the Anadarko to Continental? What would it look like, right? So that's where Hamadarko came from. You know, right. Harold Ham, Hamadarko. Um, and so yeah, so we're 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 promoting that. I think Zach even trademarked it. So like we've got <laughs> <That's incredible. laughs> we're, Sounds right. we're, we're all it. about it. And the Continental engineers love it and have a great time with it. And again, it's a it's a fun concept to kind of play around with. Um yeah, yeah it's a you know, it's a very real possibility. Omenov yeah. has no rigs running in, in the Anadarko and people are kind of focusing on the Permian and 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 doing other things. And you know, Ham's like, What are you guys doing? This is crazy. This is a premier oil and gas basin in the United States put money into here focus yeah. on this basin and so he's like if you want i will you know no, yeah. that's crazy i mean that because i mean and obviously i think someone from uh here what but they showed a graph and it is amazing how much the permian's contributing right now yeah but like there's i think the value is in some of these other basins i mean we've been lucky at gme we've got two deals so far where mm -hmm. like getting at a apparently a pretty good discount you know, yeah time will tell but like yeah it seems to be going pretty well for us so far and there's like, running room all over the place yeah. i mean i some people might disagree but i mean i you know i think that as oil price sustains and stays high, all these secondary targets are going to be economic across the U.S. Yeah. And as we go back and, and learn more about them and um, we apply some of these more modern frac techniques that we've been doing. And I know frac's, frac design has been kind of similar over time, but I mean, we're ah, running casing for eh. cheaper. You know, yeah. the tools are better. We're more consistent. Um, you know, does, I, I think we're kind of settling on a 3000 pounds per foot design across the U S that seems to be pretty standard. Yeah. And, um, you know, a kind of a cluster spacing that's pretty standard. So, I mean, we're getting better and, and, yeah. and everyone's, everyone, getting better, I was gonna say, everyone's there's getting so better. Much, there's so much opportunity yeah. in the OG shale basins. To oh, come back sure. in refract. Cause I mean, yeah, I've only, we did it. We were a number of wells at Ensign. Yeah. yeah. It, and they're great wells. That's the mm -hmm. thing is like, 
just thinking about, I mean, the first five years of my career, I was a frack engineer and uh, thinking about the fracks that we did in 2010. Versus... You're telling me that 800 pound crosslink fracks aren't the best type of fracks? <laughs> the amount have. of crosslink fracks <laughs> I have pumped is just ridiculous. And I mostly worked in gas bases yeah. just to give yeah. you an idea of how horrible those yeah. designs were. Ugh. But uh, no, it's, it's, yeah, there's, I think there's huge, I, that's one of the biggest things I feel like I've learned in my experience in this industry is the sexy thing is not where most people make most of the money, right? Oh, yeah. It's the, Definitely not. oh, well, here's this thing that's been here for a while. It's actually proven. There's lots of data on it, but it's not the new, like even just conventionals, right? Yeah. Like conventional stripper wells. You know how much money individuals oh, make on conventional There's tons of bypass stripper pay. wells. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like coming in, my father-in-law has some stripper wells up in Louisiana and he can come in and shoot a 10 foot <laughs> perf mm -hmm. or 10 foot zone and double the production overnight exactly. with one wireline. Is that worth like it? it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy. And so I think, yeah, that's just a big thing. A lot of people don't pay attention to is that like, Hey, these are the oil is not going anywhere. The gas mm -hmm. isn't going anywhere. Just cause it's not the sexy thing that the investors want to hear. Doesn't mean that there's not value to it. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing, I mean, you know, one of our main, deals here is that we want people to take maybe new ways of thinking or doing things um so you know speak as much as you want about it but like how are you guys deploying spot fire for forecast because like i mean pretty much anyone i know in oil and gas is probably deploying it on-prem mm -hmm. and they're on a windows box using sql server you know as the database behind it and everything i mean like um yeah, how, how are you guys deploying it? I mean, I can't ride that too much for an operator because we did that. We did that. No, no, we, too, no, we yeah. did too. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I'm not knocking, but I mean, I think it's but good as a people to realize provider, they can do different. it cheaper. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you can do it significantly cheaper, even not having to host it yourself. So, yeah. so that's that's kind of what we do. So what what areas do you see like room for improvement, or have you seen kind of gains or optimization on on your end? Yeah, I mean, I think people should be using the web player more. I think yeah. that's going to get more and more popular. And even for for people who are using it from from an analytics license or a business author perspective, oh, yeah. where they're editing it and creating things, um, the web player is getting more and more powerful. And Spotfire is deploying tools that help you auto scale and help you use uh, containerization to to deal with the complicated mess that they created in some ways on the server side for, yeah. for deploying a web player um because she because you got to use python nodes and r nodes and you got to use a server node and you got to make sure that they're not on the same machine or the, like they're at least containerized so that they're not conflicting with each other and stealing resources um but it's so powerful and it's so fast because we host the data on the same bare metal servers like we just we host our own bare metal servers and I just, you know, I just lock them down and, and you can have the spot fire creates you a say great you host, architecture. But, but I mean, I want to clarify that too, because yeah. like, because some people like bare metal, maybe they like, they actually have their own server. Oh yeah. Mr. I mean, Mr. Hughes. <laughs> yeah. 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 When I say bare metal server, I mean, it's through a third party contractor. Like they, they stood them up and I just okay. said, Hey, I want that machine. And, okay. they, and I pay them a monthly fee for it. Yeah. And, um, like and so co-located. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like co-located, but we didn't put our own hardware in there. I mean, they own the hardware. If yeah. it fails, it's on them and they'll give us new hardware. Sure. And I just use like a backup service that, you know, I can just replicate it, you know, the next day if I need to. Um, and so we've got, um, our own, bare metal servers and then we're expanding to this bare metal cloud idea where they basically keep ser their own servers running and then partition them to to people who want to just turn on a machine um yeah. on the fly and so you can use tools like rancher that will you know auto scale kubernetes and and um which you know controls docker images so it's like you got all these layers of auto scaling that you can use to yeah. um horizontally scale your your web players and i think that's where most people can and should go with spotfire because Tipco Cloud is like okay, it's cool, but it's just so expensive and, and it's limited. so limited. Yeah. Shock, shocking. Yeah, right. And so I can do so much with, um, you know, with with Python and R scripts and and like a web player that yeah. it would amaze you. I mean, there's, I started writing script. One of the things that, um, you know, not a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people think of is I actually write scripts that that write out my axes because the axes and the spot fire plots can get super complicated. Yeah. Especially when you have a lot of options, a lot, and you want to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And I, you know. It, we're on like a consumer license for a client. So it's like, they can't change any of that. Yeah. So you have to make it accessible in some really, you know, friendly Unique way. Ways, yeah. And so I, it was getting, some of these were getting so complicated that I just started writing Python scripts to write the, okay. to write the axes Smart. labels. Yeah. And so it works really well. And so you basically just drop out a string and it'll like, Oh yeah, this is just like, you know, 20 okay. line long, uh, uh, option full of options and ideas. And then of course you can iterate over things and make it easier. So, yeah. 
but again, you know, the big thing there too is like you're hosting it on Linux because again, that wasn't yeah. ever an option before. So I mean, Linux That's is true. a free operating system. Yes. And then are you using Postgres as the database instead of SQL I'm using server? MySQL. I'm using... Okay, uh, so you can use MySQL as the back end. Oh, oh, for Spotfire, I'm using the, Postgres. Yeah, Postgres oh yeah, 14. The spot, as far as the Spotfire database. Yeah, so I'm using Postgres 14 for Spotfire and for spatial objects. So okay. like shape files and things like that. It's just easier to handle them. And, and that's free. And yeah. then, uh, like you said, I'm using Ubuntu 22.04. That's free. Yeah. Um, and Spotfire server, to, it, there's not a lot of great support for it. So if you're struggling, just give me a call if you have a question. Um, Spotfire, I hope you're listening. Because yeah, I love Tipco. Spotfire itself. Yeah, Tipco, excuse me. But Spotfire is great as a visualization tool, but you guys are so proud of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the problems is the community support goes all the way back to like version seven and, and, and even earlier to version five. And so it gets really confusing about what's relative, what's valid and what's not. <clears throat> so the support's a little rough, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it can be done. We run ours on Linux and it runs, really, it runs great. Yeah. You know, we run our database on MySQL and, and that connects perfectly to it. And, yeah. and, and you can set everything up just the same way you would on windows and you save a boatload of money doing that. So yeah. I want to ask, how do y'all, because this is something I never would have even thought about until Bobby and I worked together mm -hmm. at, at RDS. But how do y'all manage or what are some you know creative, unique ways that you manage visualizing a bunch of data, right? Like when we were at RDS, right, we're getting one second data and the engineers mm -hmm. swear they, they need needed to every see every single data. Every single, single second. Even though it wasn't point. changing over the course of an hour. Right. Like yeah. Half on a, yeah, on a PSI. But. On a DFIT that's changing yeah. 0 0.02 PSI and you know, a week. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I d you don't need every data point, but like, let's yeah. talk about that because I do feel like that's something that a lot of people don't talk about until they get into it. And they're like, well, shit, what do I do here? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is, is, is because like I told you before, like I'm building this and, and with the perspective that I want it for me, like I want, I, I understand how, you know, companies create value and I, and I solicit a lot of, you know, ideas and advice from other people, but, but I know what I need to see. And so one thing you can limit a lot of columns just just knowing that right like yeah. i don't need all this ancillary data that's being reported publicly like i just no one's gonna ask me for this so so i can cut out data that way and kind of streamline it um the second thing is i use a lot of the built-in tools in spotfire for on-demand data loading yeah. and i think it's it's underutilized mm -hmm. um they have a lot of uh, advanced caching that they do that's hidden and so you can load stuff on demand uh really quickly that is on a database so i could bring in you know a bunch of wells so that's kind of how our data loading page works you bring in an entire state or multi-states or multi-basins worth of wells you just rope rope what you want and you can do some filtering down if you don't want that much data sure. i estimate how much data is going to be downloaded and then you hit set a project and then it brings in all the production data it brings in all the header data all the forecasts uh that are like pre-done so you can have a starting point and you can edit them and, and manipulate them in the software yeah. and you get all that data all at once and so I think that on demand component is kind of how you solve that cuz yeah it's hard to to cache you know all this data yeah. at once you know like like you know Brian McCallan his his Sabata stuff like you can easily say well this is the database it's not going to change yeah. like everyone's going to look at Texas and this is Texas right so he can use automation services and and yeah. throw that data in there and keep it updated we can't really do that because everyone's looking at something different right. we got people looking at Colorado we have people looking at North Dakota we have people looking at Texas and so we need, they need to be able to, you know, pull that data on demand whenever they want. Yeah. No, that's, uh, yeah, it's like I said, it's just one of those things that like you don't think about until you're standing there and you're like, man, there's only so many literal pixels on, yeah. this, on this screen and there's only so many points I can put in those pixels. Exactly. Yeah, you do get limited. I mean, Spotfire, like once you hit, you know, a couple million rows, it kind of gets a little, it gets a little yeah. hairy, it gets a little boggy on the, on the map chart. But it's still but, one of the better, like, fastest it works visualization yeah. tools that's that's out there. It honestly. does. That's, yeah, it, it you can't argue with it. It it works. It works really well. It's super easy to use. Um, it's it's fairly easy to modify, and it's just so customizable that you yeah. can just yeah. do so much with it. You know, I mean, the text area is just literally a blank canvas. Yeah. It is. Exactly, <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. I mean, it's a, you can do it's almost a website. Yeah, like, you can inject almost anything you want in terms of HTML and CSS into that. Yeah. So super super powerful. Um. One I've been wanting to ask, and it would be a great uh, LinkedIn engagement question, is uh, R or Python? Oh, definitely Python. Yeah. Um, I will say R has, if you're using Spotfire, 
R has the advantage of having very little overhead because the data types are the exact data types that are native to Spotfire. Yeah, tear and everything. So yeah, so you don't have to worry about like that overhead. So when you're talking about like interactive scripts and things like that, R definitely is a little bit faster um, when it comes to like manipulating stuff in Spotfire. But as soon as we're out of Spotfire, yeah. we're going to be all Python and JavaScript because it's yeah. just like the Python just has so many powerful vectorize functions and it's so easy to use and it's constantly evolving and um yeah definitely python yeah. sorry sorry our users no, no i mean <laughs> i think it makes know. sense that the swiss army knife of oil yeah. and gas would choose the swiss army knife of uh A programming languages yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that actually no i mean it's it's to me it's using the right tool for the job right? yeah like r is more statistic like math focused and mm -hmm. stat focused and if you have those or like Matt, you know, MATLAB is similar too, right? Like yeah. we use MATLAB in college all the time. I've never used MATLAB again, but there's still lots of people that use MATLAB because MATLAB is good for what it does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me, the better question, because people, as soon as you put R versus Python, I mean, Python just does so much. I mean, I, yeah. for me, if you said R versus pandas, like, or let's say the tidy versus, versus pandas, like as far as syntax to syntax, I'll probably take R and that stuff personally. Well, okay. But but you don't have the numerical optimizations behind it that you do with pandas. Yeah. So with NumPy being natively used behind pandas, there's so much vectorization. Yeah, it's it so fast. depends on the size of your data. Yeah, so it. for big data sets, I think that... Yeah, yeah no, I, I wouldn't disagree. And, and I've moved I use so much more Python than R. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's fun to get back in R when I get a chance, yeah. but yeah. And Shiny's got some like great interactive tools for plotting and things like that. So yeah. if you are using that, I mean, you know, you can expand on it and make some great interactive tools yeah. with R. So but it's got a lot got of power. Python, you got Streamlit and you've got... You yeah. Know, I mean, poly dash and all that. So. There's a lot more to do. And then like, you're like, oh, well, I can use statistics and do things like that. And in R, well, you got stats models is, yeah. is brought natively into Python. So you can do all the same functionality that you have yeah. um, in the community. So. I mean, both communities are very good. That's the Python great. community is just insanely. Huge. It's just like, massive. So, yeah. yeah, it's just massive. It's like, it doesn't seem like it's ever going to. Sl uh, that's probably a terrible thing to say <laughs> out loud and put into the universe. But it just seems like it just like there's all there's multiple packages for damn near anything you're trying pretty to much do. anything yeah. yeah like and most of them have documentation and, and yeah, i mean one of my buddies has been yeah. stuff out for the maritime industry like <laughs> yeah. there's you know four different things i've learned about this week that are packages exclusively for maritime data yeah it's like I mean, I think there's there's lots of ways you can use Python that almost makes it look like no code. I mean, yeah, you, can, oh yeah. you can put in such such simple functions I, that I mean, that have. I mean, it might have a little bit of overhead, but you can put in some really simple things that are so abstract that can do a ton of different yeah. work. Yeah. I, I I've been messing around with some workflows and for us internally, and I can use uh, OpenAI's Whisper uh, audio to text transcription with two lines of code that's unreal in, yeah. in a google collab notebook and yeah. it'll run it'll run and transcribe an entire podcast wow. by itself in a notebook in google collab that is running not on my machine at all cheers for jupyter notebooks holy cow like that's a you yeah. know if you want to learn python learn it in notebooks because uh, that's you know so true. it's a great uh, I, it's it's weird to call an ide but it kind of is like an ide right yeah. like yeah. you can type in it and, you, and it can and you can run it um I was actually speaking of IDEs. What I'm kind of curious what you guys use because I have a funny sort of evolution of my IDE journey. Yeah, I mean, I, I use VS Code and I have for the last couple of years. Yeah, I'm very opinionated on this topic because my first like real coding that like legitimate coding that I ever did was when Bobby showed me how to use R in R Studio. Oh yeah, yeah. and I'm a very I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm very visually oriented, mm -hmm. and just having that stupid variable explorer there. <laughs> It's yeah. just like it changes everything for me because I can highlight a chunk, run it, see what happens. Yep. When yep. I'm, because inevitably I'm a horrible. It is neat in R Studio. You can like literally select the line that you want to run, yeah. like yeah. highlight and boom, run. But it. I, mean, it's I think like both you get both that concepts, whether it's yeah. R Studio or a Jupyter Notebook. I mean that yes. that REPL idea of being able to like run chunks, cut and, a cell, and run it. And even right, like yeah. for me, like even a lot of times I'll develop in in a Jupyter Notebook and then put it into a mm -hmm. Python script. But like when I can, yeah. you know, again, you're doing API development, like, or calling from an API. You don't, I don't want to hammer that every time I run a script. Yeah. Right. You know, let me just like call that into this cell. Now I can work on everything downstream of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and just like for me, a lot of it is debugging because I'm not a good developer. So there's inevitably going to be something wrong with it. Yeah. And so it's there's like, if I can copy there. and paste something from, you know, uh, which this is how I develop generally stack overflow or from uh, Bard or chat GPT. GPT and throw it in there and then okay well how do i i know what i want to do i know how this works generally and i can start debugging it line by line and saying okay well this is where i need to change the for loop yeah. or whatever it needs yeah. to be right um but 
I wish there was a better Python ID natively, just like out of the box where I didn't have to go in and customize my entire yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, you VS and I still got to sit down. I, mean, I know. The we Python, ex- the Python extension in VS Code is pretty good. I yeah, like- yeah. That's really good. I mean, if you want something that's similar to RStudio, you should explore, download and just play around with Spider. Spider. Spider's actually yeah. kind of similar to RStudio in the, yeah. the way it's laid out and the uh, way you put plots up. PyCharm is honestly my favorite one. PyCharm is really good too, yeah. Just because it's it's... Yeah. straightforward and again easy I just, to set up i mean and, like, you're, you're, you're using multiple things out too i mean like as soon as you want to start using multiple languages like you know yeah, VS yeah Code, just the you use a bunch of things yeah, yeah. but what's well, I'm sorry, okay you're saying what's your okay. uh, so evolution my funny story is i didn't know a lot of python programmers in the oil and gas industry for a long time because it just it was kind of a small community yeah so so what i used in grad school i just wrote straight in vim so i yeah. use like vim windows and i just saved like dot pies and dot, so you know and, how to exit dot Java. so i literally yeah i know how to exit vim yeah <laughs> <laughs> escape colon q yeah. um so um if you've got our wq so you do save yeah. it um so if you've got just like gvim like this like just a basic very basic editor which actually is a great tool for opening mm-hmm. big ascii files so, so it's, it's just for doing that you can right click in windows and open giant ascii files i think in i've Vim. actually downloaded that when i was at rds yeah to yeah open these it's giant a, csv yeah, we, we, we went so through every for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, and so vim can do column edit column by column edits which is really nice and things like that so anyways i used just like straight vim windows for like 10 years for a long time i was very resistant to going into any yeah. ide and so when people watch me code i would just code and code and code then like i i would just have to run it and if it worked it worked and if it didn't like i got to figure out what the error message says like i had no debugging yeah. capabilities oh. and so i did that for a long time and i think it's kind of like a school of hard knocks thing like oh yeah that, that sort of hardened me and maybe yeah. pretty good at typing things uh carefully and mm-hmm. and reading my code and debugging on the fly like in knowing what i'm writing so i didn't get really reliant on that and so what what broke me was not that long ago sean sean aslo we were talking about he showed me his setup in vs code and i was like oh you can just like take five seconds to create a virtual environment you don't have to go through this whole process of building it on your mm-hmm. machine yeah. and like having you know a whole package set up and everything separate and he's like yeah you just you just literally say what version you want and 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 then you can pull up a terminal and run it in yeah. it and like holy cow so i already had VS code in there um, mm. because I really like the the ability for it to log in remotely without having to go through PowerShell and all that. Yeah. Um, so there was some some usefulness there um, that I was kind of sort of using it for. And then he showed me that, and then I started diving into it and looking at extensions. And so now yeah. I'm a VS so, Code guy. Yeah, so now I use it. Then and you add Copilot I mean, and you're you have to get yeah. yeah. Have you done the uh, GitHub Copilot yet? No, I'm still very resistant to people to, to having somebody inject uh, you know some really like an LLM into my code and and have it potentially, I don't know if it exports or not. I'm sure it runs native, but I don't know. I'm very resistant to, to debug tools also just because I'm a little bit weary of of how making myself over, over reliant on them yeah and so i'm still kind of have that that old school mentality yeah but if you like, i like to write thing, out yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you didn't have debug tools yeah. for 10 years that's yeah that's so be a hard so it's for our intern right? he, he sent me he sent me his like baseline code and i was like oh it looks good and then i start like going through like all right we do this do this do this he's like you're not gonna run it <laughs> i was like no we're just gonna write it and we'll figure it out like yeah. it'll 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 run or it'll work or won't work and then it ends up you know i i fairly experienced with what he was doing so it just you know it ran sure and he was just like oh yeah, that gives me so much anxiety just hearing you say it out loud <laughs> just coding lines and lines and not ever like it actually prepares it. you really well for working in spotfire because spotfire debugging yeah. is horrendous yeah, when you're writing terrible, data yeah. functions in python um yeah, in and r even yeah i mean you don't get really any good feedback no you don't all. get any feedback i mean the if you turn on the debug tool um you get a little bit more like you can at least see print statements i didn't know that for the longest time yeah. i was like how do i print <laughs> how do i print in python to do yeah. like basic you know debugging um and so so yeah so i you know you spend enough time doing it and you get you get kind of good at what you're doing and get really careful and and you can you can write a lot of uh really clean code like that um, I use Beekeeper for my SQL IDE, so okay. I really like it. Um, it is it is open so- it's it's open source yeah. and it's really available. But I we like pay for the developer version to okay. help keep it supported. Does that do like auto formatting some of that too? Or it does a little bit. It has yeah. like uh, format qu- magic. I don't really ever use it because um, no. I again I'm <laughs> this is part of my I just like writing yeah. stuff out, you know, and I like writing it in the format that I want to write it in. Occasionally, if I get if I get really lazy. I'll use ChatGPT to write really long queries, but like, or I'll write. I used to write Python code. I used to write yeah. Python code to write SQL queries. Yeah. So I would like, okay, I got to loop over this annoying, you know, thing over and over again to create this view or to make a to make a certain um uh query. And so I would do that also. But ChatGPT's kind of changed that. It's like I can format things. I can 
copy a list of things out of Excel and be like, make this a Python dictionary. Yeah. You know, like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. No, that's... Uh, or JSON. Like, make this a JSON, right? I need all these different fields. Write me out a JSON template for this. And yeah. I'm like, it's crazy. That's also fantastic for documentation on code. Oh, amazing well. for documentation. Yeah. It's my favorite. <laughs> I, can, I, I, I could know what the code does and be like, what does this code do? So it writes out some documentation for me. So if I go back later and be like, all right, so I know why I did this. Because sure. there's yeah. lots of code that I've written and I'm like, like oh, yeah. either I look at it, I'm like, God, that was so smart. Why can't Why? I think like this? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I've forgotten yeah, that good I did comments this. Comments you know? ever like a love letter to your future self. Exactly, like, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then and then there's times it's like, yeah, this comment saved my life. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. That's uh <laughs> That was one thing Dave taught me when I was in grad school. He was really good at commenting and very good at, at documenting and writing things out. And so that taught me early on like how to do it and what level of robo- okay. robosity I mean, you need. To needed. your point though, using a really bare bones editor like that, it's way more necessary too. Like, it hardens I mean, you. Like, yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right, we jump got, into the yeah. We've got a few or? minutes left, so we'll we'll end it as we normally do with the speed round. We'll cool. just pepper you with some questions and go yeah, from kinda there. Quick one word, one sentence kind of answers. Yeah, okay. Um, you got what's you your uh, first yeah? What's your favorite cloud provider? Oh, none of them. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> um, what is your what's top uh? either top or just recently favorite uh, book that you've read recently or, um, or paper for that matter? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I feel bad I don't remember the name of the book. <laughs> it's, it's a venture capital book. Um, yeah, there's a venture capital book I read. It's like Blue and Orange, and I and, and I know it was a really good read about how oh, to think I build a VC and how to, how to build a VC, how to, how to raise VC money and how to build a startup, and it introduced me to a lot of business concepts around equity and things like that that I... Um, that I know now, but yeah, I feel so stupid for not knowing the name of it. <laughs> no, we'll People will we'll, recognize it. Maybe yeah, we can uh, tag it in the comments. Yeah, yeah there you go. Um, what's your favorite open source project? Oh, um, pandas. Is that, is that basic? Yeah. Is that the pumpkin no. spice latte of, of Python, yeah, uh, you're of the Python packages? It. I mean, so. It's just so powerful. You can do yeah. everything with it. It's amazing. Have you looked at polars? Uh, I haven't. I've been I've been told to look at pollers a few times. Yeah, but I, have I haven't explored it. Either, into it. But I mean, it's I'll like a time. When thing. I need to get stuff done, I get my data's not usually big enough to where it's a big constraint. But I can make things really fast in Panda, so yeah. I haven't had like ah, oh, this is too slow. Yeah, problem yet. Favorite video and or board game. Oh, Settlers of Catan. I will play that any day of the week, and I play. I had been playing it online quite a lot, so it's a really bit of a fun game. Nice. And advice. Last time. What's that? You want to do advice? Wrap it up. That's beautiful. You go. You can go for it. Yeah. What's uh? What's what's some advice you give to somebody either looking to move into energy tech or kind of starting out, you know, in the the development programming world that wants to kind of coming into the energy space? Yeah, I, I think two things. Uh, go find problems to solve and solve them as fast as you can and show people how you solve them and get feedback. Like that feedback loop. I know people say it all the time. Feedback yeah. loop in programming is really important. I'd also encourage you to find, uh, I say this almost every time I've interviewed, find mentors, like find as many mentors as you can, many quality mentors yeah. as you can to get to know them really well. And there will be an invaluable resource for your entire career. And they're super important. No, yeah. that's, no. that's a great way to end it. Cause it's, <laughs> well, and just like with our generation in the energy space, right? Like there are so many guys that are retired or still you know in management or whatever that have so much great experience especially in all with all the nuanced shit that we have to deal with in oil and gas yeah that like let's make sure we lean on them exactly yes we make fun of them boomers blah 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 but they know a lot right like yeah they still have a lot of information mm-hmm. they've seen some shit yeah. they, they forgot yeah. more than you know like it's exactly. it's amazing like it's a they know a lot yeah awesome appreciate well, it Andrew. Yeah. thanks for yeah. being on man. thanks for having me guys where, uh, of course where can where can people find you I'm mostly on LinkedIn now. Um, I'm I've I've uh, since deprecated my uh, Twitter and on on account because it was taking up too much personal time, <laughs> um, and so I've uh, put that to pasture. Um, so yeah, mostly LinkedIn. I'm around a lot at uh, industry events and things like that. And then of course you need to check out uh, Forecast and uh, Forecast does have a, a Twitter page, LinkedIn page, and Forecast uh, io if you want to check us out. So. Num- number four. Number okay. four. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. four c a s t io. Um, but yeah, if you ever see me somewhere, just, um, come up and chat with me. I'm pretty open. Cool. Appreciate it, man. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks Thanks guys for coming on.